Well, today, as we look at uh, another title that we see in uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, uh, the thought comes to mind as we look at this, we're looking at Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So get your Bibles ready. Uh, we're going to look at some different passages today, and um, not necessarily Bible drill. We've got a lot of stuff coming on the screen for you to keep us moving. But as we think about today, Mighty God, as I thought about that this week, I thought about feats of strength. Have you ever seen someone do something that you looked at it and you saw it happening and you knew it was happening, but somehow in your mind, you just kind of thought, how is this happening? How is that person able to lift that? How are they able to do that? What, what is going on here? Um, one of the most amazing feats of strength in semi-recent history, uh, it was, I, I was born, but barely, uh, in 1982 in Lawrenceville, Georgia, a lady named Angela Cavallo, Cavallo I'm, not, I'm not pronouncing that right, it's something like that, uh, had a 17-year-old son, a junior in high school, he was working underneath his car, uh, his 64 Chevy Impala, and uh, she was inside working on kind of doing some stuff in the kitchen and heard a loud noise and came outside and saw her son unconscious pinned underneath this vehicle where the vehicle he was working on had fallen off a jack. Now, his mom is around 50, 51 years old at this time, no one around to help her. She calls for help and runs to the Impala, and this 50, 51-year-old lady lifts this Impala off of her son 12 inches and holds it there, trying to kick him and wake, so one foot, right, trying to kick him and wake him up. He is not waking up. There's an 11-year-old boy who was visiting his grandmother next door, saw what was going on, ran and got help. They got her son out from under the vehicle. She is holding it this whole time. They get him to the hospital, and within 24 hours, he's released. There's no brain damage. There's no issues, no nothing. An incredible, an incredible feat of strength. Uh, there's a name for this. There's a name for this type of strength. It's called hysterical strength, and it's, it's brought on by some of the fight or flight uh, mechanisms in the body, uh, is what science says. I, I think there may also be some sort of a spiritual element that God just said, okay, you're picking this car up right now. Um, uh, but what an amazing thing. What, a, what an amazing feat of strength. It's kind of like how maybe the Grinch had the power of 10 Grinches plus two, Right? Uh, we talked last week as we began um, this idea of Christmas confusion, um, and, and I think in our culture, in our world, a lot about Christmas gets confused. We have traditions, we have things that, that we like, that are, that are fun, that feel Christmassy, that, but that aren't necessarily Jesus, right? And, and some of the Christmas confusion plays out in so many different ways. We talked about some of our, maybe some of our favorite movies last week. One of the things to me that kind of plays out in some Christmas confusion, I'm going to be careful parents, don't worry, is some of the Santa stuff, some of the Santa stuff. I, I got online this week, and, and that's a scary statement, and you don't necessarily want preachers to start with that. Hey, I got online this week. Um, but um, some, some statistics about Santa and his, his feats of strength himself. There are, uh, as of last year, there were approximately 2.2 billion children in the world. About 418 million are fans of brand Santa. And 376 million of those 418 are estimated to have been good. Okay? <laughs> so out of 2.2 billion children, we're down to 376 million. Now, that may, not, you might, that might not compute to you, but that is a stark drop and children. So out of the 376 million good kids, there are approximately, we can kind of average of that, three kids per household. That's 125 plus million, yeah, yeah, uh, average, average, you're helping others, okay? <clears throat> 125 million households for Santa to visit. So Santa, because of all the kind of the, the time, all this stuff, how it works, he has about 31 hours to finish his work, assuming he logically travels east to west on how this kind of works, okay? Um, so this, this delivery window of 125 plus million homes, 
breaks down something like this. It's, it's 4,045,161 homes per hour, or 1,124 homes per second, or 1.12 homes every millisecond. He's, he is moving. He is zooming. Okay? So in one millisecond, Santa, supposedly, parks his sleigh, chooses the correct gift, gets into the house, and eats, his, eats the snacks because we are leaving that sucker some cookies, okay, fills the stockings, and is back up and on to the next home. The rate that he must go to, okay, uh, to cover that distance in this window, he would be traveling at 16,453,729 kilometers per hour, or... 4,570 kilometers per second, okay? Just for context here, and we'll stop now. Uh, we won't talk about how heavy his packages are or anything like that. 13,000 times the speed of sound is what it would take for him to do all of that. Now, I'll leave it at this, Christmas confusion. Christmas confusion, and we spend a lot of time thinking about things that aren't necessarily Jesus things, okay? So God doesn't want us to live in confusion. God doesn't want that. He's not a God of confusion, is he? He's a God of peace. He's a God of clarity, okay? So 700 years before the birth of Jesus, this prophecy is given, and it's given. It's, and, and we get these titles for the Messiah, for the king that's going to come, for the son for the child that is to be born, for the son that is to be given, according to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And let's look at these titles again just real quick. Wonderful Counselor. We talked about that last week. I want you to think about this for a second. The one today that we're looking at is, is, is maybe more special than the others, but as they fit together, they, it's a good thing. Wonderful Counselor. Think about Everlasting Father. Think about Prince of Peace. Potentially, those three titles could describe someone who's human and potentially only human, right? But then the one we're looking at today, which is the second one in the order that we're looking at, he's mighty God. Listen, the, the, the baby that would come, the child that was to be born, the son that was to be given, Jesus. Did anybody see the, the beautiful display on your way in in the, in the welcome area out here? Oh, it's gorgeous, gorgeous, absolutely. Gorgeous. But that baby laying in that manger, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. As we look at this today, this is evidence that this child is not just a human, this child is the son of God. Now the Jews were looking for a human ruler. They, they thought Messiah was going to be just a, a great king. That's what they thought, a great man, a great king. They weren't expecting him to really and truly be God with us. He is fully man, fully God, and as we look at today, he is mighty God, and nothing is impossible for him. Would you turn with me just for a moment? I want you to see something, and I want to connect this, and we'll get into our points. Will you turn to Luke chapter 1 with me? Luke chapter 1, this is this beautiful passage of, of the angel's interaction with Mary. We won't read the whole thing. I just want to pick up in verse 35. Luke chapter 1, verse 35, and the Word of God says this, and the angel answered her. Well, we'll go to verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? Verse 35, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow, overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. This is what I want to... If you walk out of here today, this is what I want, want you to walk out of here with. Ready? Okay. We serve the one true living mighty God and nothing is impossible for him. That's what I want you to walk out of here with today. Most of us have things in our life that we think, I mean, I know God can do it, but he's probably not gonna. Nothing 
is impossible for him. Okay? Okay? Okay. Let's get into the outline. Number one, Jesus is mighty God. Jesus is mighty God. We're talking about him. So this passage in in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, is speaking about Jesus. Let me read it to us. It may even pop up on the screen for us. For unto us, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. I just want to make this comment as we get into Jesus as mighty God. He has to be mighty God in order to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. But guess what? He is mighty God. Jesus is this mighty God that this is talking about. So let's break this word down. Just like we did last week, wonderful counselor, let's look at mighty God. First, let's start with God. This word for God is L. It's the idea of the one true God, the idea of the most high God, the most high God. So this is what this is talking about. And now the word mighty. The mighty is the idea of having all power, especially this word has to do specifically with military power. How many times have we read in Scripture, the Lord of hosts? Right? Well, what's that talking about? What's the host? That's the angel army. He's the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts will do it. Um, Exodus chapter 15, verse 3 says, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Matthew 26, verse 53. Jesus is in the, in the process of being arrested. Peter uh, pulls out a sword, and he's very bad with it, okay? He tries to kill a guy, misses, and cuts his ear off. That's what happens, okay? So he cuts the guy's ear off. Jesus uh, fixes all of that. But in that process, this is what Jesus says. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus is illustrating here that this is part of the plan. You don't have to defend Jesus. Peter, you don't have to defend me. I've got this. This is part of the plan. Jesus said this in John 10, verse 30. I and the Father are one. So Jesus is mighty God. He is who this text in Isaiah chapter 9, he's who this is talking about. So number one, Jesus is mighty God. Number two, Jesus possesses all power. Jesus possesses all power. Now listen, no one has any power that God hasn't given it to, but it's only on loan. It's theirs maybe for a season, but it's not really theirs. It's his. They're stewards of it, and we better answer for how we handle what God gives us, right? A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, says, writes this. It says, God possesses what no creature can, an incomprehensible plentitude of power, a potency that is absolute. Doesn't that sound like how we don't talk anymore, right? No one's tweeting this, a potency of absolute, unless they're quoting him, all right? This we know by divine revelation, but once known, it is recognized as being in full accord with reason. Grant that God is infinite, so give it, let's assume this, let's grant that God is infinite and self-existent, and we see at once that he must be all-powerful as well. In other words, how how could he be those other things if he were not also all-powerful, right? And reason kneels to worship before the divine omnipotence. It goes on. Let me just read a little bit more. God has delegated power to his creatures, but being self-sufficient, he cannot relinquish anything of his perfections and power. Being one of them, he has never surrendered the least iota of his power. He gives, but he does not give away. Lastly, it says, since he has at his command all the power in the universe... The he-man child in me is like excited about that part right there. 
Since he has at his command all the power in the universe, the Lord God omnipotent can do anything as easily as anything else. What you think, maybe God can do it, but he probably won't, and I don't know, could he really? The family drama you're going through right now that you experience at Thanksgiving and you're dreading at Christmas. The difficulty with your child, the difficulty with your parents, the difficulty at work, the difficulty, like whatever is going on in your life, that it feels like this is hopeless. God can do anything as easy as anything else. All his acts, it goes on, all his acts are done without effort. He expends no energy that must be replenished. His self-sufficiency makes it, makes it unnecessary for him to look outside of himself for a renewal of strength. All the power required to do, all that he wills to do, lies in undiminished fullness in his own infinite being. It's there, and it never, go, it never gets low. He's never, going to the, he's never going to the gas station, right? He never needs to. Listen, Jesus is the God who created all things by the word of his mouth. He is the God who sustains all things. He is the one who judged the world yet simultaneously saved mankind in a worldwide flood. He rescued his people from famine by allowing Joseph to be sold into slavery, wrongfully imprisoned before ascending to number two in all of Egypt. He rescued his people after 400 years of slavery by sending 10 plagues and parting the Red Sea. He watered his people from a rock twice. He parted the Jordan River. He gave the bronze serpent for healing in in place of judgment. He brought down the walls of Jericho. He caused the army to prevail while the leader Moses prayed with uplifted hands. He caused David to slay a giant. He multiplied the widow's oil. He raised the Shunammite's son. He sent a great fish to swallow Jonah and then spit him out right in the right spot. He, he sent fire down from heaven, proving he is the one true God. He cured Naaman of leprosy. He rescued three Hebrew boys from the fiery furnace. He saved Daniel from the lion's den. He was born a baby. He healed disease. He raised people from the dead. He forgave the adulterous woman. He gave sight to the blind. He caused the lame to walk. He made the deaf hear. He carried the cross up the hill of Golgotha. He laid down his life for all mankind. He took it up again on the third day. He ascended into heaven, and he is coming back to collect his church. He has all power. He has all power. Jesus says, now all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. But then, listen, when we remember that he is all-powerful, the end of that rings even more true. He says, and I'm with you always, even to the end even to the end of the age. That's who he is, and he has all power. So so listen, uh, what are we worried about? Like, Seriously, what are we worried about? Number three, we can know Jesus' power, and guess what? He wants you to. He wants you to know his power, to know what it is and to experience it. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, We see this prayer. This is part of this prayer. And Paul is praying for the church in Ephesus. And I want you to to listen and follow along with me what Paul prays. He says this in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Let's keep going. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power Toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places. Did you see what what Paul's praying for us that we would know? Among the listen, among the other things, we can know. And Paul is praying that we would get it. Have you ever just seen people who just like they just don't get it? 
Like, I don't know what's wrong with her. Probably what's wrong with her is the same thing is wrong with us. It was just earlier on for us. <laughs> or it's the same about us, just a different topic right now, right? And it's like, they just don't, they just don't get it. Paul's, Paul's praying, I want them to get it. And one of the things I want them to get is I want them to get that they can know the power of God. We can experience that, that we would know it and that it would affect the way we live our lives. We can know God's power. John 14, 10 and 11 says this, Do you not know that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. The works should show us the power of God. And Philippians 3.10 says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death. We can know the power of God. We can know it. We can experience it in our lives. Have you? Are you? But can I tell you, you know where it starts? It starts with us admitting some things. Let's, let's look at number four, our response to the mighty God. And this is not comprehensive. These are just some things that I felt like were important for us today. But I think I'll, I'll call these kind of the big rocks today, okay? Let's put the big rocks in first. That way the other stuff can get in there. All right, Here, here's what I believe are the big rocks, our response to the mighty God, our response. First, fear him. If he's mighty God, now we, we, we can be grateful that we have a personal relationship with the mighty God, but maybe we should approach him purposefully. We can approach boldly the throne of grace, but not because of us. Because of Jesus. The word of God in, in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, it says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Why do we want to obey the Lord? Well, in part because he's God. Listen, he doesn't owe you anything. The word of God says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Step one is you going, well, most of us have this perspective a lot of the time with God, and it's like, how come you didn't come through? Why didn't you do what I said? You've heard me say this. Like, we treat God like he's a vending machine. Lord, I hit C2. Why didn't I get what I ordered? How come I didn't get that spouse that I ordered? I thought that's what I was getting, and then this is what you gave me. That's, sorry, Jules. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking you about me. How come I didn't get this that I thought? Like, how come, how come, how, why, God, why? I, I did what I, I did my part. That's not fearing the Lord. That's you trying to, that's you thinking God should fear you. So step one, our response to this mighty God Fear him. Number two, admit my weaknesses. Stop coming in this place like you have it all together. Stop it. That's my counseling technique, by the way. Like, hey, I well, okay, don't do that. Stop. Like, I, I'll send somebody. I'll send you to somebody better for more like depth. Okay. Don't, don't walk in this place as if you are strong on your own and you've got it all together. Because guess what? You are lying to us when you do that. Come in here in the grace of the Lord. Yes, not defined by your past, not defined by your sin any longer. But stop pretending you're perfect because you're not. And guess what? Neither am I. We want to grow in that. We wanna, we're, we're becoming like Jesus. Amen? But we admit our weaknesses. Paul, he says, look, because of the great revelation given to me, I was given a thorn in the flesh. And I asked God three times to take it away. And it goes on in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. This is God's response after Paul prays for those things. And God says, no, I'm not taking them away. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power, again that word, my power, 
is made perfect in weakness. Paul's response, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We don't do that. Normally, we try to cover up our weaknesses. Paul's like, I'm boasting in them. Guys, you, you know how messed up I am? Like, like, Paul's perspective here. This is, this is what I did before knowing Jesus. This is where I still struggle. He, another passage of Scripture, he's saying, like, the things that I know I should do, I don't do them. And the things that I know I shouldn't do, that I should hate, that's what I do. But it goes on, O wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin? Praise be to God that Jesus, Jesus brings that freedom. He brings that salvation. He brings that hope and that peace. It goes on, verse 10. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Admit your weaknesses. One place that you do that is in, listen, in your in your Jesus communities. If you're not in a small group, shameless plug right now from Pastor Eric for small group. If you're in a small group but you are not yet in a D group, listen, don't try to make it all formal, whatever. Just If you're a lady and you're in a class and there are two other ladies in there that you like, start a D group. Okay, let's, can we meet once a week and let's pray together and let's encourage one and let's hold each other. It doesn't have to be like fancy. It doesn't have to be formal get together and listen in that community you know what you do you share your struggles you share your weaknesses and you pray for one another and you see God bring healing you see God bring victory practical victory in your life that you know what I used to really be tempted and struggle with that and I'm still tempted but I'm not giving in anymore praise God so we admit our weaknesses if our response to the mighty God we fear him we admit our weaknesses, and then James chapter 4 tells us we submit to him. We submit to him. There's this four-letter word that we think is profanity, but it's not. It's this four-letter word, and the word is obey. We think it's legal. Oh, it's just legalistic. Well, I mean, I guess the way you use it can be, but maybe it's just you love Jesus, and you follow him. So submit to him. James 4, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So we submit to him. We obey. Next, we follow him. Now submit and follow are, are hand in hand, but they're slightly different. Submit is, okay, God, you're right. I'm wrong. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit to you. Following him begins, okay, I'm not, just, I'm not just avoiding sin. I'm living with purpose now. I'm following you, Jesus. I'm, I'm living with purpose, and you are my identity. You are who I am. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Next, how do we respond to the, this mighty God? We follow him, and next, we live in his power. We live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11 says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Just listen. If the spirit of God is in you, he's going to empower you, according to Acts 1.8, to be his witness. And he is going to empower you to be, specifically to be a witness for the gospel of Jesus and to live according to the gospel of Jesus in such a way that it just doesn't look normal. And that not looking normal often is what God uses the most to point people to him. Uh, a couple days ago, this, there was a, a video, and it's, it's, kinda gone, it's not kind of gone viral. It has blown up on social media. This video is of a, an 18-year-old girl her father is a police officer, and this last week, her father was shot and killed. And she spoke at his funeral. She spoke for a little over eight minutes. We're not going to watch all eight minutes. We're going to watch 90 seconds of it. Okay? As we watch this video, I want you to think about how abnormal what she says, kind of how it feels like almost like this is off but it's right. Watch this. Hey, 
remember having conversations with my dad about him losing friends and officers in the line of duty. I have heard all the stories you can think of, but I've always had such a hard time with how the suspect is dealt with. Not that I didn't think there should be justice served, but my heart always ached for those who don't know Jesus. Their actions being a reflection of that. I was always told that I would feel differently if it happened to me, but as it's happened to my own father, I think I still feel the same. There has been anger, sadness, grief, and confusion, and part of me wishes I could despise the man who did this to my father, but I can't get any, of, any part of my heart to hate him. All that I can find is myself hoping and praying for this man to truly know Jesus. I thought this might change if the man continued to live, but when I heard the news that he was in stable condition, part of me was relieved. My prayer is that someday down the road, I'd get to spend some time with the man who shot my father, not to scream at him, not to yell at him, not to scold him, simply to tell him about Jesus. Only God can do that. Because most of us from the outside, we go, I want justice. This young lady saying, I'm not saying justice shouldn't happen. But you know what she understood? You know what she understands? What I hope you understand. That because of Jesus, we're not getting what we deserve. And that man who shot her father in this life should get what he deserves. But I hope he doesn't have to take what he deserves in the next one. Just like all of us. Because my sin and your sin is just as vile in the eyes of God as that man's sin. That was an example of a young lady living in the power of that God supplies. She knows her mighty God. Two more, two more points. Our response, we worship him. We worship him. He's mighty God. There's, listen, there's no one like him. He, see, he, declares, the, he declares the end from the beginning. He sees it all and nothing is outside of his power. Nothing. If that doesn't cause you to hit your knees in awe, I don't know what will. We worship him. And last, we watch him work because the battle belongs to him. There's a song, and we're not singing it right now. There's a song and it's by a man named Michael Farron. And the title of the song is called Fighting For Us. Part of the lyrics say, you don't back down when it comes to your children. You fiercely defend us till we stand delivered. You're fighting for us. Psalm 35, one through three says this. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuer. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Is the Lord your salvation today? Is the Lord your salvation today? Is he your defender today? If you know him, here's what you need to know. He's fighting for you. He has fought for you. He loves you. And he knows you. And listen, he wants you to know him as mighty God. If you're in this place today, though, and you have never come to know the one true living mighty God, here's the thing. 
In the same way he's fighting for us, he has fought for us who do know him, he's fought for you. He's fought for you, and you know what he did? He, although you and I, we have sinned against a holy God, and we deserve the wrath of God on us. We, do, we have broken God's design, we have broken God's creation, and we have continued to contribute to the brokenness in this world because of our sin. You know what? Even though we've done that, God loves us. And he loves you. So this is what he did. So that you would not have to take the punishment you deserve. Because the punishment you deserve is hell separated from God forever after a broken life. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. But God sent his own sinless son into this broken world. And his son died on the cross after living a sinless life to take your punishment and my punishment. When Jesus died on the cross, he was taking the sins of the world on himself. And that was your sin and my sin and the sin of all mankind. He took our, he took our punishment. But, that was loud, but because... He is the Son of God because He is mighty God. Death could not hold Him. The grave could not hold Him. And on the third day, just like the Bible says, Jesus came back to life, declaring He had conquered sin and death. And anyone, hear me, anyone who will put their trust in Him for salvation will be saved.